Okay, the yes, the pulpit's on. <clears throat> We're sure glad you're here tonight. Uh, boy, I tell you what, I, I was just reminded, you know, the Bible said, uh, forsake not the assembly of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And then the next words there is so important. As you see the day approaching. And boy, we can see it approaching, and there's a need for God's people to get together. Amen? For encouragement, and uh, be to where that the Lord can have His way in our life. Uh, I know each of you here tonight desire for God to have His way in your life, or you wouldn't have come. Amen? Amen. Now, some of you may be having a little bit of trouble lassoing your thoughts and getting your thoughts together, but I'm going to encourage you tonight that you get as much out of this service as you possibly can, that you just pack as much into your mind and into your heart and into your spirit as you possibly can because the world is constantly feeding us the wrong material. Go ahead, Frank. Right. And uh, I'm believing God's going to do something for us tonight. Amen. Anybody have a prayer request, something you need God to intervene in your behalf? Nobody? Everybody's well, huh? <clears throat> well, I tell you what, we need to pray for the, the people in the Ukraine. Uh, we're, not, we're, we're not having even any difficulties compared to what those people are having. And uh, with death, losing family members, losing their homes, their, their businesses, uh, their country, Losing everything. And uh, we're so blessed. We need to pray for them. And I would encourage y'all to pray like I've been praying. God, would you fight their battles for them? Amen. Because if the Lord fights them, they're going to win. Amen. Any, does anybody have a prayer request? Okay, let's stand and go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Maybe you will before the service is over. Uh, let's ask God to have His way tonight. Would you just pray in your own way? And let's all just ask God to have His way in our hearts and our lives tonight. Father, we're so grateful for Your love, Your mercy. And we just thank You, Lord, for the privilege that we have to be in church tonight. And Lord, I pray that You'd help each of us, that we may put aside anything that is a hindrance, Lord, from receiving from You. I just ask God for the power of God and the Holy Ghost to come down and to touch every heart and every life, Lord, that your will might be accomplished. I rebuke the powers of darkness through the name Through the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke all the powers of darkness that would try to interfere with anybody receiving from the Lord tonight. Help us, Lord, that we might open our spirits and our hearts and and we could hear your voice. I pray, God, you'd anoint every part of the service, that you'd anoint the singing, the preaching, everything that's said or done, that you may be glorified, Jesus, as we lift you up in this service tonight, loving you and praising your name. We love you and we praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus paid it all. Amen. I think it'd be good for everybody here to just lift your hands and tell the Lord you love Him and you're thankful for what He did for us. Lord, we praise You and we worship You. This service is dedicated to You that You might be glorified in it. And we want You to know, Lord, that we're grateful for the price that You paid on Calvary that our sins could be forgiven, our lives could be transformed. And Oh, yes, Lord, we praise You and worship You tonight. Oh, in Jesus' name, we worship and love You. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are our Lord. You are King. And we worship you. 
Let's give him a good clap offer and just saying, Lord, we love you tonight. We're not ashamed, Lord, to worship you. We're not ashamed, Lord, to give you praise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I think it'd be good for everybody here to just say hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Brother Gary. of times, maybe in the last uh, couple of months, but um, it, it seems to be relevant now more than maybe it has been in the past. I want us to sing Living by Faith, amen. Um, I know we've, we've talked about it many times, but our faith is tested. Our faith is on trial. Our faith is on display. Uh, but the reality of the situation, it is a prized possession that God has given us. Every man has been given a measure of faith. Amen. Let's sing Living by Faith today. Hallelujah. <laughs> I care not today what tomorrow may bring If shadows are sunshine or rain The Lord I know ruleth for everything And all of my worry is vain I'm living by faith In Jesus above I'm trusting, confiding in His great love. And from all harm safe in His sheltering arms, I'm living by faith and I feel no alarm. Though tempests may blow and the storm clouds arise, obscuring the brightness of life, I'm never alarmed at the overcast sky. The master looks on at the strife. I'm living by faith in Jesus above. I'm trusting, confiding in His great love. Are you doing it tonight? And from all harm safe in His sheltering arms, I'm living by faith and I feel no alarm. I know that He safely will carry me through No matter what evil be tied Why should I then care though the tempest may blow If Jesus walks close by my side Hallelujah, I'm living by faith Oh yes I am Lord, in Jesus above I'm trusting, confiding in His great love. And from all harm safe in His sheltering arms. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm living by faith and I feel no alarm. I like this. Our Lord will return to this earth some sweet day, and our troubles will then all be o'er. 
The master so gently will lead us away beyond blessed heavenly shore. And I'm living by faith in my Jesus above. Oh, yes, Lord, I am. I'm trusting, confide in his great love. And from all harm safe in his sheltering arms, I'm living by faith and I feel no alarm. Let's sing that chorus again. Oh, I'm living by faith. Amen. In Jesus above. And I'm trusting, confiding in His great love. And from all harm safe in His sheltering arms. Oh, yes, Lord, I love you tonight, and I thank you. Thank you, Jesus, and I feel no alarm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. I want to sing a chorus, and I don't even know if we've got it up there. Uh, It's an old, old chorus, but it goes along with that. Uh, I know the Lord will make a way for me. Amen. Bryce, do we have that up there or not? There it is. Look at there. I know the Lord will make a way for me. I know the Lord will make a way for me. Oh, if I live a whole And shun the wrong and do the right. I know the Lord will make a way for me. Do you believe that tonight? You believe it? Let's sing it like we mean it. I know the Lord will make a way for me. Yes, I do, Lord. I know the Lord will make a way for me. Oh, if I live a holy life and shun the wrong and do the right, I know the Lord will make a way for me. I know the Lord has placed His hand on me. On me. I know the Lord has placed His hand on me. Amen. And if I live a holy life, And shun the wrong and do the right. I know the Lord will place His hand on me. Hallelujah. Do you believe that we can walk in such a way in this life that we can experience the genuine touch of God on our lives? Amen. Amen. Not just some fictitious feeling. But we can look back and say, God had his hand in that. Amen. Amen. You may be seated tonight. Praise the Lord. Dad's going to come read us some scripture for us. I don't know if you want that. I remember the day that Sister Tina called me and she thought she was going to die. You remember that day, Sister Tina? And, uh, she came to the place that she, she recognized that it was touch and go. And she said, Brother Thomas, I want to be sure I'm right. 
that I make heaven. And I just thought, all of you that's come tonight, there's a desire in your hearts to make heaven. Amen. It really is. They, if it wasn't, you wouldn't be here tonight. Right. There's a desire. But I do, I do know that we're living in some perilous times. There's a, a magnetic pull from the world trying to pull the Christian into the world to be, that, be to where that they cannot even be identified as a Christian. Go ahead. Go ahead. That's happening. And also another thing that y'all are facing, you're having, you're having to battle to be to where you can give God any time. If we, we're, we're talking about starting up Sunday night service and maybe starting up Sunday school again. Amen. And uh, the carnal man is saying, I do not want that because my time is so limited and it's so valuable. There's a battle going on. And it will go on. But you're going to have to fight if you make heaven your home. I want to read you some scripture tonight, make a few comments, and I'm not preaching. Uh, we got a good preacher preaching for us tonight. <clears throat> I'm looking forward to Brother Moran preaching. But uh, let me read you. Uh, just, and I want you, hey, would y'all really give me your attention for just about just a few minutes and really listen to what I've got to say here? Because I really feel like the Lord spoke to me about this in the night and. Uh, I just jotted down some scriptures that I wanted to read and try to expose what he had touched my heart with. Uh, he, he, he just sort of touched my heart that tonight it's going to be meat time. Sunday will be meat and milk mixed because they, some folks can't take meat. They choke on it. But really God is calling out the people that have really made up their mind to go to heaven, he's calling them out for a, a dip, to make a difference in, in their lives. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3, it says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now this is the Lord talking. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the Father upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So he's saying, if you... If you love me, I'm going to love you and bless you. But uh, in 1 Corinthians, we talked about this in our, our Wednesday night class. We used, we used 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 10. We talked about it. But I just want to read to you up to that, just through verse 9. It says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea, and were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the spiritual drink that they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Amen. Listen to verse 5. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now the things were our example. He said, you don't have to go through and have this happen to you that happened to them if you can, right. if you can adjust your thinking and get right. hold of yourself that you don't have to go through this. Now these things were our example to the intent that we should not lust after evil things. And I, I told you that you, there's a magnetic pull of the world trying to pull you to the world that you would uh, love the world, that you would look like the world, that you would act like the world. The world has got a pull on the church today. 
He said, uh, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And in verse 7 it says, neither be ye idolaters. As, or, and, and I'm going to elaborate on that just a little bit here. Uh, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Uh, God got mad about this. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. He said, let this be your example, that you don't have this to happen to you. Uh, now, I, I looked up uh, idolater in vines, was well, strong, and, and then I extended over to vines uh, dictionary. It says, uh, uh, it's found in a number of scriptures. Uh, the warning is to believers against turning away from God to idolatry, whether openly or secretly, consciously or unconsciously. Now, I want to explain idolatry just a little bit here. Uh, let me, uh, uh, it, it's, and I, I read to you at the beginning that you're not to have any other gods before you. Uh, really, idolatry is when in your mind, you, now y'all need to listen to this, in your mind, you make you a little god. In other words, Brother Thomas, I don't believe like you do. I've got my God, and, and my God, I can do these things that you say I can't do. Are y'all y'all hearing what I'm saying? People, people make little gods in their mind of what they think they can get away with. Yeah. You've got to have this book. Go ahead. It's got to be what directs your life. Uh, I, I thought about, I've got a granddaughter down in Oklahoma. I'm really concerned about her and her husband. I remember uh, we took up money and sent uh, uh, Chrissy to Bible college. And uh, Todd and Chrissy and Chad and Brittany were godly people. They were godly couples. They really were. They, they, they dressed, they behaved themselves, everything godly, but something's happened. And it doesn't happen just all at once. It's just a little bite at a time, a little pull at a time. Uh, maybe start off with, uh, well, I want to paint my toenails. Maybe I want to get me some false fingernails. Uh, Chrissy's already got to the place that she's got a tattoo, I understand. I hadn't seen her tattoo, but I understand. Has she got a tattoo? Any of y'all, do y'all, anybody know for sure? Y'all don't say a word, will you? Let's see, if, if you got a tattoo. Uh, hey, hey, listen, now if you got a tattoo and you got it before you got saved, hey, I'm not talking to th them people. I'm talking about, I'm talking to people that have known God and they walked away from God. Go ahead. And you may think it won't happen to you, but you start building up that little God in your mind of what you think God is and how he's pleased with the way that you live and what you do. And if it's outside of this book, friends, you've got the wrong God you're worshiping. Go now I'm going to read you two more scriptures and I'm going to get out of here. In Revelation 22 and 15, it says, For without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, that's them people that has them little gods built up, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie, they're outside. Revelation 21 and 8 says, But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. 
Now, I can't just leave you there. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17, it says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean things. Unclean thing. And I will receive you. And listen to this next verse. He said, I'll be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Hallelujah. It's not just a, a bad sight, but I, God wanted you to hear a warning tonight. Amen. Amen. And I know that this is meat, this is not milk, but I believe you folks are here for the meat. Amen. Amen. God wants us to come out from among the world and be a separate yeah. people. Be the word that we're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't identify with the world. We don't look like the world. We don't talk like the world. And we're not of the world. Amen. We're of another world. Hallelujah. Yeah. Brother Gary. This morning before daybreak, I was down at Menzer. Uh, and a trucker friend of mine and I got out. We were talking. And uh, he and his brother from Pueblo and um, they had a sister-in-law just pass away and they couldn't find a priest to perform the service. And they didn't know what they was going to do and they finally found someone and so they're having a funeral tomorrow. And um, so I, um, I got talking to him about his soul. And um, I said, Louie, there's two immutable facts that we none of us can run from. We're all going to die, and after that, there's a judgment. Amen. And uh, we have to be right and ready for the judgment. And um, Brother Thomas talked to us about meat and... Uh, I've heard my dad say this many times, from the cradle to the grave, all this life is about, it's a proving ground to see where we're going to spend eternity. That's it. That's all that matters. If we, just, if we, if we can figure that out, if we can war the warfare, fight the good fight of faith, and lay hold on eternal life, and don't let go, amen, we're going to make it. Amen. Brother Wells, would you come and help us receive the offering tonight? Uh, amen. Amen. Thank you for always being a faithful people to give to the work of the Lord. And um, amen. Jesus told them in the New Testament concerning their their giving, and he kind of was making light of the how meticulous some of the Pharisees were that they paid tithes on the mint and the coming. But Jesus said this you should have done and not left the other undone. And so we, we don't want to leave things undone that needs doing, right? Amen. So let's give to the work of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your blessings. We love you. And God, we want to, uh, we want to demonstrate that in a very real, practical way so that you would uh you would you would help us to not let any any idols form any gods that would get in front of you anything that we would hold in place of where you should be i pray lord that our money would always be on the altar and uh that it would be at your disposal we're just stewards it's yours in jesus name bless amen
last days are Polini Polini Safe and secure From all along Lean on the everlasting arms Amen Very, very, very briefly uh, Upcoming events uh, this coming Wednesday night, we have our annual business meeting. And if you claim this is your church, uh, or you just want to know what's going to go on around here in the next year, uh, please feel free to come at 7.30, and uh, we're going to have uh, our annual business meeting. We, we do not have tense business meetings. I know that uh, I have heard about church business meetings being very contentious. I have never been in a part of one uh, we do not uh, vote on a lot of things around here. The church is not a democracy. Amen. And uh, if there's things that we need to vote on for legal purposes or this, that, or the other, uh, there is a lot of unity here. We're marching the same direction. We want to see people saved. We want to grow in righteousness. And we want God to add to the church daily such as should be saved. That is our goal. Amen. And so there's not, uh, there's not contention. We're, we're trying to help people get to heaven. Amen. So be a part of that. Uh, the next thing on the agenda is our upcoming revival. Um, well, we have, we have a very special event happening before that. Easter is the 17th of April. And I would encourage you, it's not so much anymore, but it used to be that uh, folks that didn't even go to church would go to church. They'd be willing to go to church at, at Easter. So take advantage of that. If you know some neighbors, if you know some family members that may, that may uh, you might be able to talk them into coming to church on Easter. Uh, let's let's try to let's try to do everything we can to get a, get a, get them here. Amen. Because the God's word will not return void. Amen. And uh, the gospel will be preached, and the word of God will be uh, will proclaimed. And uh, do you believe that Jesus can change people? You believe that? Amen. I was talking on the radio today. This 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 one particular trucker, he's very 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 foul mouthed and and just never receptive to the gospel ever. And the guy kind of likes me. And um, somebody somebody on the radio they said, preacher, you need to pray for Ron. And I said, I have been. And uh, they said, well, I think it's a lost cause. I said, oh no. You said you don't know Jesus. Jesus can save anybody. He's a miracle working God. Amen. And I was talking about that on the radio. Everybody could hear me. I didn't care. Amen. Because uh, I believe that. I believe Jesus can change anybody. Amen. Well, anyway. And then we've got uh, our upcoming revival. Brother Noah and Sister Carla is going to be here uh, the 24th through the 27th. And we're going to have a wonderful, wonderful revival. We are in prayer. I'm believing that God is going to fill people with the Holy Ghost. He's going to light a fire under people. He's going to make evangelists and, pe and preachers out of, out of some of you. Amen. And, uh, and I, I'm just looking forward to what God's going to do at our revival. And then uh, May the 6th, uh, we have a work day here. Put that on your calendar. Everybody be, huh? The seventh, uh, okay. The sixth, seventh. Uh, the, yes. And if y'all notice, we've already started doing some things. We've, we're making some changes out in the vestibule. Uh, we're gonna put some different flooring down. Uh, put some different colors. Uh, my wife's went and got these beautiful uh, things up here, uh, just trying to make the church uh, look a little fresher and uh, prettier. And uh, we we need to we need to work on the building. And people I've heard people I've heard people say, well, I don't think you ought to be making you know making an idol out of the church. We ain't making an idol out of nothing, amen. amen. But you read over in Leviticus, brother. God was pretty detailed about how He wanted His tabernacle, amen. amen. And He wanted certain colors in it, and He wanted it certain uh, gold and brass and places and certain kind of wood. And He was very 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 meticulous, amen. And, uh, and I read in another place where he said that uh, their houses were built, but the house of God wasn't built. And then I read in another place where in Nehemiah, he said, yo, whoa, 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 don't bring no more. We, we, we can't take any more. The people wanted to give so much. And so well, somewhere in the middle of that, we need to land and make sure that the building is in good shape, the grounds are in good shape, and it's a testimony that we value the things of God around here. Amen. 
Amen. Enough said about that. And then the last thing, uh, well, that, well, the last thing I'll, I'll mention is uh, the first Sunday in June, we're having Truckers Day. And uh, I'm going to need all hands on deck. I, I would love for Truckers Day. I, I just, the other night I was, I was, I was laying, in, laying, laying in, uh, shaking on, on, on the bed and I was just, I just began to kind of think about Truckers Day. And in my mind's eye, I saw that whole parking lot full of truckers, and we had to preach out on the on the on the uh, deal like we did in, at COVID, and we was preaching that the whole whole parking lot was full of truckers, and God was doing a work. Amen. Amen. So please let's uh, let's let's do everything we can to try to reach people for Jesus. Amen. We are so delighted to have Brother Moran preaching for us tonight. I am so thrilled to have Brother Robert and Sister Brenda being a part of Souls Harbor. Brother Robert, come. And uh, I have so enjoyed the visiting that I've done with him over the last few weeks. And Brother Moran has a desire to see people saved. He goes and preaches on the street and uh, passes out tracts, witnesses to people. And uh, has a heart to build the kingdom of God. Brother Moran, tell us what you believe the Lord's laid on your heart. Amen. Love you, buddy. Appreciate you. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, the last time, the last time I stood behind this pulpit was in 2018, about three and a half years ago. And uh, it might take me a bit to get ready, so... Uh, I understand that some people may have plans to go to IHOP. You might want to cancel that tonight. <laughs> but, um, amen, I am glad to be here. Um, Brother Thomas and Brother Gary, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm not one to, this is not a street, it's not a street corner. I'm not one to yell and get all excited. It doesn't mean that I don't have a lot of conviction in what I share this evening. I certainly do have a lot of conviction on this particular sermon. And I do believe, I really believe it will encourage you and I believe it will challenge you. Amen. Let's go please to Matthew chapter six, verses five and six, and let's stand together please for the reading of God's word. This is what Jesus said, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. This evening what I would like to speak on is praying in the secret place. Praying in the secret place. And oh God, gracious Father, I pray, open our ears tonight, open up our hearts to hear from you. Loose my tongue, O oh God, to speak that which needs to be spoken this evening and be glorified in all of this. And help us, God, in Christ Jesus' name to leave here a bit closer to you than when we arrived. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. You may be seated, please. We know this passage comes from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's account of the sermon. In chapter 5 of the Sermon on the Mount, we know that when Jesus, seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And that is, the multitude of people may have been in proximity to hear the words of Christ, but it was directed to the disciples. 
If you read it carefully, you don't have to go too close, you'll see he is talking specifically to the disciples. And I say that because if you are a follower of Jesus Christ this evening, then you also are a disciple. And this word applies to me and it applies to you. Jesus tells us first how not to pray. He says, don't be like these hypocrites, those who are praying to themselves. They go out to the street corners and pray. The corners, that's where they come together, where the most people will be. Don't be in the synagogue, standing there for the only purpose that people would see you, to give a display. And they found the perfect timing, didn't they, to go out and, and pray publicly in order that they would have the praise of men. Christ said, don't be like them. They already have their reward. But thou, and he says it in the singular here, the thou and thine singular, he's talking to them and he says, you, Peter, you, John, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. Now that closet is, uh, the closet is tamayon. The word is tamayon. And that means that it's a, an inner room or a secret room, a room or a chamber. It's in secret. It's in private. He says, you go there and you close the door. And when you have, you pray to your father who is in secret. Now, I believe in this verse, verse 6, that when Jesus says close your door, he means literally close a physical door. But I just want to clarify something, and I believe you'll agree. It doesn't require a door to be there. There is, in in fact, places in the world they don't have a door. And to be stuck on something like that, I just submitted early, to be stuck and say, well, there's no door, therefore we get lost in this somehow, Um, I just want to share that the further meaning clearly should be to get away with God. Get alone with God, whether there's a door or whether there's not a door. Get alone with God and get shut away with him. And you and I are no strangers to being alone with somebody. Consider our husbands and wives, girlfriends and boyfriends, fiancés. We enjoy getting alone with each other. How I am in public before you now is different than when I go home this evening. The jacket comes off, I talk more personally to my wife, and it's not that being in public is being disingenuous or being uh, dishonest. It's just that we are different as we need to be from being in public and being behind closed doors. Take employers and employees. The employer, if it's something personal or very important, will take that worker to the side. Brother Steve, I'm sure you will. They take him off to the side and they close the door and talk to them personally. There's something different. A commanding general, I was at Fort Carson yesterday, a commanding general can get all the soldiers, he can get, get thousands of soldiers in front of him and talk to them. But he's not going to talk to them the details about a particular mission or a training exercise. He's going to reserve that for his higher ranking officers. There's a difference between meeting in public and meeting in private, you see. We have examples in the Bible. If we turn to uh, Exodus chapter 20, verses 20 and 21. Exodus 20, verses 20 and 21. Moses has been coming up a lot in our Wednesday night study. Great discussions there. Moses has been coming up. And in this passage, Moses is going to get the Ten Commandments off of Mount Sinai. And and the Bible says, Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces that you sin not. And the people stood afar off. And Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. So Moses, leaving the people behind, was called by God. Exodus 24 tells us that God called him to go in that darkness under the shroud to be hidden alone with God. There is a time and a place where we need to get alone with God, even if it, are, if it is those people that are going in the same direction with us. In other words, friends, even if it's our church, There is a time that you and I have got to get away with God. We've got to get alone with him. should be very clear in that passage. Exodus 33 says that God spoke to Moses as a man speaks to his friend. There is a time we need to get away, as Moses did, in secret. Luke chapter 3 and verses 2 and 3 is one of my favorite, one of my favorite 
persons in Scripture. That's John the Baptist. In Luke chapter 3, it says, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Where was John Baptist? He was in the wilderness. Now, in these first two examples, I have four. These first two examples, there isn't praying done in the passage that I selected, but it would be crazy to think that Moses and John the Baptist were not praying. Of course they were. Um, But John the Baptist is in the wilderness. He's praying there. He's alone with God. There's nobody else around. He's shut away with God, and he comes out preaching. John the Baptist, when you see him in Scripture, I know that he had disciples, correct? But most of the time when we see John the Baptist, we refer to him or think of him as the man who's all by himself with God only. He's the man that eats locusts and wild honey. He's shut away in the wilderness. He comes out and he does this. He preaches, he's with Jesus, and he gets martyred. That's what he does. A simple life sold out for God, and there he is in the wilderness all alone. Jesus said concerning John the Baptist, there is none greater than he. Another gospel says that there's no prophet as great as John the Baptist. So my question, friend, is if John the Baptist had not been out in the wilderness, shut away with God, could he have been so used so mightily by God? I think not. He was shut away. And we also need to be shut away with God regularly. Amen. Peter in Acts chapter 10 and verses, uh, verse 9, Acts chapter 10 and verse 9. This is Peter. On the morrow they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city. Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Now, Peter goes to the rooftop. I did this once at a place I used to work, and they didn't like it very much. Okay? It's true. It's a four-story, four-story building. So Peter goes out on, onto the rooftop. Why? Perhaps to look at the people of the city where he would be ministering, perhaps to look at the glory of God. I don't know if he would be able to see it, uh, what's around the city, I don't know, but certainly to get away from distractions. He gets away from everybody else, he withdraws himself and goes to the rooftop. Now, consider this, it's in the text. Peter prayed about the sixth hour. It was very common then that people would pray in the morning, they'd come back and pray later in the evening. Peter prayed the sixth hour, which is 12 noon. Peter arranged the affairs of his life around prayer and not the other way around. He didn't just pray when when it was convenient. He ordered the affairs of his life in order that he could pray. Did he have a, a busy ministry? Of course he did. But he goes up to the rooftop at the lunch hour, and there he prays. I wonder if we should be doing the same thing. Jesus, my last example of getting shut away with God, getting alone with God, and then discussing this, praying in the secret place. Jesus, our Lord, says in Mark chapter 14, Mark chapter 14 and verses 32 through 35, and they came to a place which is called Gethsemane. And he says to his disciples, sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John. And began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. So here, Jesus Christ comes to the garden with his disciples. I don't know if the disciples stopped at the entrance to the garden, just shy of it, or if they went in a bit, I don't know. I do know, looking at this scripture, that he has the disciples stop. And then he takes those that are closest to him, Peter, James, and John. He says, come with me. They go a bit further, and what does he tell Peter, James, and John? You tarry here. Wait here while I go a little bit further. What's the lesson in that? What what is something that we can learn from it? When the soul is in turmoil, the Bible says he's heavy, very heavy, it says. When the soul is in turmoil and we're in anguish about something, here Jesus is about to be arrested or handed over to be arrested and ultimately crucified. Those that were closest to him, even those, did not move forward with him. 
And what I'm saying and what I'm trying to articulate is there are times in our lives, infinitely less than the passage that we just read, but there are times in our lives that even, Brother Gary, the people that are closest to us, our family and those that we love, there is a time we have to leave them behind. There's a time where we have to do things and say, it's just me and the Lord now. Do you understand? There is a time that we have to leave them behind. The spouse, husband or wife, we leave them behind and say, I've got to do this. I've got to face this with, the, with God. I've got, to, I've got to be there with God and just he and I. There are times like that. Nobody can stand in for your faith, by the way. I may say it a little bit later. I'll say it now so I don't forget. Nobody else can stand in for your faith. Brother Gary, Brother Thomas, you can't fill in for me. I have to go forward, do you see? Well, we know the importance of getting shut away with God is not only in Scripture, and there are many examples in Scripture, but also we have preachers here tonight. We have good preachers here. And if you and I would discuss uh, preaching and we said, what are some of the great preachers in the English language? We would probably come up with the same names. We would probably say Charles Spurgeon, John Wesley, George Whitfield, um, Martin Luther, we might say. We might say A.W. Tozer, Ravenhill. We'd have a lot of those names in common. Those preachers did not have everything in common. Great preachers, you know that. Wesley being Arminian. Whitfield being Calvinist, but yet they preached together and became close friends. And some of these people, and the great preachers in the English language, great preachers of any language, don't always have everything in common. But what the great preachers agree on is that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one can be saved apart from Christ and Christ alone. And the other thing that great preachers understand is the privilege and power of prayer, and that nobody can preach without prayer. They all had it in common. And I select preachers because we of all people ought to know the business of prayer. Our ability to stay with God in the prayer closet will measure our ability to stay with God outside the prayer closet. Now, in our house, in Brenda's, in my, in my house, our house, we have, when this house was built in 2019, we went there very often to pray over every part of the construction. We knew that the first room as you come into the house was not going to be the bedroom, though that's what it was called, but it would be a prayer room. We had one in our uh, home before that, and that's what it is. It's a prayer room, and I would like to describe it for you, describe this prayer room. Or some would say prayer closet, some place to get, sh get shut away with God. This uh, prayer closet, prayer room, we usually say prayer room, when you open the door, it's the first room, by the way, as you walk into the house, so if you come over, we'll show it to you, right? It's the, it's the first room, and as you open the door, and you go in, there's a simple futon or couch of some type uh, that you can sit in. There are two tables there, uh, some nice people made those, one on either side of the place where you can sit. On one of those tables, there's a songbook, a hymnal, and on the other table, there's a Bible. Next to that Bible, there's a lamp, and that lamp is always on. There's a place there, of course, you can stand. There's a place where you can walk back and forth, and, of course, you can kneel. The windows of that prayer room face the north, northeast. Sometimes there's music in there. I listen to a gentleman named uh, Dappy T. Keys or something like that. That's the name he goes by. It's very similar to the music that we had on Monday evening, which is a great time. Sometimes there's no music at all. Now, the Bible that's in there is open just to check a scripture or maybe pray a scripture. The songbook, the hymnal, when my wife is home, is never used because I don't want her to hear me sing. But when she leaves, I'll sing. But what I'm getting at is, even with those items in there, they're not used very often, the books. And neither are other books used in there because it is dedicated for prayer. There is, I believe, and I say this incidentally, there ought to be, there's a time for 
devotions, and there ought to be a time designated for prayer. Because what happens, and I don't want to go too deep into this, but I think you get it. What happens when we say we all have a prayer room, a prayer closet? And then we bring a whole library of books in there, and we end up writing notes and everything. And the last thing we do is pray. We've got to keep that prayer room a prayer room. And that's how I describe our room to you when you open the door. But that's not really the important part. What I want to do is describe this prayer room to you when the door is closed. When you enter the prayer room... This could be your room, this could be your prayer closet, that hidden room, that hidden chamber where only you and God go. And you close the door. This is not an all-inclusive list at all. These are just some of my observations. It is, first of all, a place of honesty. It is a place of honesty. In public prayer, we have unspoken needs. And that's great. We need to. It's scriptural to have corporate collective prayer. Praise the Lord, we have it. But we have unspoken needs. When you close that prayer room and you find out how honest you can be, every need is spoken. Everything. There is no inhibitions. There's no holding back is what I'm trying to say. We can be as honest as we can possibly be in that prayer room once we close the door. I take to God in that prayer room things I will never share with my wife. And she knows that. Brother, we may be friends. Sister, we may be friends for 50 years. But there are things in that prayer room you'll never know anything about. When I go in there and when you go in there, you can be brutally and beautifully honest with God. And God will be honest with you. It is a place of honesty where you can voice your concerns. When that door is closed, you can open up to God. Secondly, I find that the prayer room is a place of holiness. It is a place of holiness. Hebrews chapter 10, please. Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 19 through 20. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. That's all the scripture I have. I will say, when Jesus died, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. I am no theologian, not at all. But when the veil of the temple was rent in twain, that is torn from top to bottom, when Jesus died... There are several things that it indicates, and one of those, I believe, is that we have access to the Father into the holiest place. The veil of the temple separated between the holy place and the most holy place. And that curtain or that veil being rent in twain indicates to me that we have access to the most holy place. It is a place of holiness because when you go into your prayer room and you shut the door and you stay there, you'll find that if you're bringing other things that you may not be proud of, lust when it is conceived brings forth sin, sin when it is finished brings forth death. And I'll tell you, when you spend any amount of time in the prayer room or shut away with God, you cannot remain with some of those things that you may otherwise be ashamed of. It is a place of holiness. And when you go in there and you're honest with God, and there's anything that is not right in his sight, there is a refining work that takes place when you're shut away with God. And he will begin and will complete removing anything that is not acceptable to him. Now, friend, I say that when we come together, we come together collected. We're in a public setting. That's, that's great. But there is something different. There's something much more personal. There's something much more powerful about meeting God alone. And it'll take all those imperfections, and it'll start that refining and working those things away. 
and he'll do it, I believe, in the most efficient, quickest way. I know of no other way such as getting alone with God. It is a place of holiness. When somebody is with God, has spent any time in the presence of God, and they know the holiness of God, and you ask them about it, you'll see it in their eyes. You'll see it in their expression. I know because I've talked to somebody in here about this very thing. And you'll see their, light, uh, their, their, their face soften. You'll see the eyes soften. And then you'll see as though they're thinking of something that they know that they have experienced. It's the spirit of the living God that they've had an encounter with. And when you go into that secret place to pray, they get shut away with God. And that holiness is there. God, who is loving and kind, is also most holy. That place of holiness, you'll understand what holiness is. And I, afraid, I'm afraid that not many people do. But you get shut away with God, and then you realize that it is Christ. When in Revelation, Revelation, Christ with the white hair and he's uh, arrayed in majesty and splendor and his, his eyes are like fire and his, out of his mouth a sharp two-edged sword and he's king of kings and lord of lords and John fell before him as dead. And they say, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And you behold the holiness of God. We can understand a bit of that in our lifetime now when you get shut away with God. It is a place of honesty. It is a place of holiness. And when we get shut away with God, it is, it is a place of healing. It's a place of healing. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals us. Everybody here, everybody here goes through times when people say something that hurts us. The power of death and life is in the tongue. And we get hurt. People say things that will hurt us. Amen? We go through times that crush us and bring us down, and I'll tell you, I'll open up a little bit, that for years, for years, I went through a time of feeling great rejection. You're not good enough. And somebody that was very close to me said four words. Can I share it? I'll share it. Somebody close to me said four words. They said, you're good for nothing. I carried that for years. God gave me this wife, a good wife, a godly wife who's jealous for the Lord. And she took me so far out of that dark place. And God, in the secret of his presence, in that hiding place with him, took me the rest of the way. It is a place of healing because when the voices come against you, listen now, when the voices come against you and say, brother, you're not good enough for that. Sister, this is as far as you're going to go. And you hear all those, the words are so damaging. God will give you a still, small voice, 1 Kings 19, that Elijah heard, you will hear the same. When I go into the prayer room, what I find out is I am both poor before God and I am also rich at the same time. I realize my hopeless condition, and yet I realize also what he's done for me. You see? And those words that hurt, we've all experienced them in one way or another, and, and perhaps much more than I ever did. But God begins to heal that. He heals it. When we get hurt, we go to friends, and we should. Iron sharpens iron. But there is also a time that the best place to be is with the great healer, the one that heals us. When I became a Christian in 1986 before some of you were born. 1986, I was 21 years old. In that early age, I became the richest man in the world. When I became a student of prayer, I said, God, teach me to pray. Then I began to realize I'm the richest man in the world. There's a difference. Do you understand what I'm saying? There is a healing that comes from getting into that prayer room that no other doc, no other physician, I should say, can take care of. Nothing else can do 
like the prayer room. If you've got something that's bothering you, it's been troubling you, a workplace, a relationship, whatever it may be, the Lord already knows about it. He can fix it. He can turn it around, get in the prayer room, and close the door. In the secret of his presence, there my soul delights to hide. How precious are the lessons I learn at Jesus' side. No worldly care can vex me, nor trial bring me low. When Satan comes to tempt me, to the secret place I go. You'll also find in your prayer room or your secret place with God that it is, it is a place of wrestling. It is a place of wrestling. What do we wrestle? Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. We know that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. But brothers and sisters, we fight that all the time. We fight that in the workplace. I was downtown preaching today. And I can tell you there's some spiritual warfare involved in that. We fight these things all the time. So I want to ask specifically, what are we fighting for in prayer? I claim that in the prayer room there's wrestling. Remember Jacob and the angel. What do we wrestle? What are you fighting in there? I'll tell you what we're wrestling for. We're wrestling for a nation that's going quickly to hell. We're praying for a city that each and every one of us would claim that, and, and I don't mean that to sound like I'm, I'm disputing with somebody, a city that we would agree. God has called us to, which was once long ago, a center point or a, a, a key city in Christianity, but it's since fallen aside. That's what we wrestle for. We wrestle for the lost loved one. We say, God, you got to break up the fallow ground of their heart. God, you got to give them ears to hear. God, you got to have mercy on them. God, that's what we wrestle for. We wrestle for that situation in the workplace that doesn't seem to be changing. We wrestle for that impossible situation when we're not getting along with our neighbors. But we take it to God in prayer. We close the door and say, God, there's nothing too difficult for thee. And I'm going to wrestle about this. I can't wrestle in public. I can't. Some of you can. I can't. It's just I'm too uh, reserved, I guess. But when I close that door, I can wrestle as much as I want. It's just God and me. We wrestle for those things that the world cannot fix. But God can. With God, all things are possible. Of course, we wrestle. In 1990, in 1990, I was stationed in Germany. And I had just received the baptism of the Holy Spirit about a year before that. And I was on fire for God. And one night, God woke me up. And he put a burden on my heart to pray for a man who was a dictator in Panama by the name of Noriega. Brother, you would know, Brother Wells, who I speak of. And some others will, but Brother Wells definitely. Noriega was a, a dictator in Panama. We removed him with our military. I didn't know anything about this man. Didn't care about him. Didn't know, would never give this man a second thought. Even though he was in the news, I didn't go there. But I know some of our forces did. I did not care anything about this man, but God woke me up, and he gave me a burden, and it struck me as, why would I have any burden for this man? So I got dressed, and I went into the living room, and I began to pray and pray and pray and pray hard and weep for this man that I don't even know, and I don't know how long I was there, but I cried out to God, and I prayed for this man. And something inside me made me care for this man. I'm wrestling for somebody I don't even know. A couple of days later, this same gentleman is on the news. The couple of evangelists, uh, separately, of course. But the story on the news is this man has been converted to Christ. And then this same dictator put it in writing 
No, his sentence was not changed. That wasn't what he wanted. But he wanted to make a public proclamation that he now believes in Jesus Christ as his Lord and as his Savior. And so it was published back then. And I remember that story back in 1990. Here's why I bring that story up. Because I wrestled in prayer. I'm sure that there were many people around the world that were wrestling at or near that same time for that same man. Because God put a burden on people just like me. Why? Why? I don't know. I don't know this man. He surely put a burden on other people. Here's what I'm getting at. I was saved in 1986. God is not a respecter of persons. Therefore, somebody was praying for me. Somebody was wrestling in prayer for me. God woke up somebody and said, pray for this man, whether they cared for me or not. Certainly, there were people praying. I'll find, about it, I'll find out about it someday. Shouldn't we be wrestling in prayer for others? God does not answer prayer. God answers desperate prayer. When you pray and you wrestle with God, you begin to find out Romans 8, verses 26 and 27, where the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. It is a place of wrestling. It is a place of rest. Our prayer room, our place shut away with God is a place of rest. Psalm 91 and verse 1, He that dwelt in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's a great place to be. It is a place of rest. You work very hard. Things go on. The nation is turning upside down. There's all sorts of things going on. People need a break. People need to rest. You don't always have to go on a camping trip or take a week off from work. You sometimes slip away into that prayer room and close the door, and the Lord will give you rest. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High, he will give you rest. Psalm 16 says, what? In thy presence is fullness of joy. It is a place of rest where we can cast all of our cares upon the Lord. And finally, again, not all-inclusive, but our prayer room, our place shut away with God, and incidentally, just to be clear, if it's not a prayer room, it might be a mountaintop, it might be a rock pile down at the state park, it might be a stream somewhere, it might be a field that nobody else knows about, but you know about it. It might be your car in the, in the back of the parking lot where nobody else knows. You go there, shut away with God, close that door. It is a place of reward. When you get away with God, it is a place of reward. A reward for what? We stay true to our text. Jesus said, your father who sees in secret shall reward thee openly. Re reward me with what? Answered prayer? Yes. God will reward us with answered prayer. I believe that God will also reward us with our faithfulness to prayer. That is, if we don't see the results, we don't always see the results in preaching. In fact, often we don't see the results in preaching. But yet we're called to be faithful. We're not responsible for the results. When we continue striving in prayer and, and insisting, being persistent in prayer, will we not be rewarded for the diligence or the faithfulness to prayer? I refuse to not pray for somebody and let them be cast into hell. Continue praying and praying and praying until that person draws their last breath. There are rewards in prayer. My question is, what is the greatest reward of prayer? This is the only point in this sermon where I open the commentary. I did look for the meaning of this word in a dictionary, the closet. The only thing I looked for in the comment, what is the greatest reward in prayer? And one of the greatest commentaries agreed in the first two, answered prayer and faithfulness in prayer. And even this great commentary didn't include the third one, and I thought, why? So I asked my wife, what's the greatest reward in prayer? 
She said, your relationship with God. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1. I don't have too much further. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Psalm 16 says that the Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. He is the portion of mine inheritance. But go back to Abram. God says to Abram, God who is not a respecter of persons, who doesn't change, says to him, I am your great and exceeding reward, or your exceeding great reward. Now, as mentioned earlier, Pastor Thomas says, uh, this is meat. This is meat. This is a little bit of meat here. The greatest reward in prayer, I submit to you, is not the answer to prayer. Because most of what we pray for, most of what we pray for, not all, is temporal. I shouldn't say, excuse me, I'll say much of what we pray for. It's temporal. When the car doesn't start, when the job isn't working out, when the kids are sick, those are important. But it's also temporal. When we pray and somebody comes to Christ and they're saved and they're born again, that's eternal. But listen, above all this, the greatest reward, and I'll take what Brenda said, and I'll bear it down. I'll, I'll, I'll take this to this bare minimum. The greatest reward in prayer is God. When we get to that point of knowing that God is a reward for prayer, then we're no longer drinking milk. It's like the person who goes along and they get into the water next to the shore and they put their feet into the water and they wet the bottom of the, the soles of their feet. So that feels good. That's, that's our prayer like we typically do. When we get to the point where we say, God is the reward of my prayer, my relationship with God. That's why I get shut away with him, so that I can know God, because ultimately that's what it's all about. That's where we're all headed. When we get to that point, we kind of get to the ankles with the water. The reward, the greatest, I submit to you, is God. You'll find that in your prayer closet. You'll find it in the secret place of prayer. How do we make the most of this prayer closet? We're going to have to close IHOP. Okay. How do we make the most of this prayer closet? I submit two things. Our fervency in prayer and our time in prayer. James 5.16 says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That fervent prayer, the second word I looked up, fervent means to put forth power. It's intense, this fervent prayer. And what we do, how to make the use of this getting shut away with God, is we pray not in a laid back, kicked back, I'm just kind of biding my time here, but with fervency. And we pray. And we say, Lord, I will not let you go. There are times in prayer I reach out. Be a little, I'll, I'll disclose. I actually reach out. And I grab. I say, Lord, your garment. So I'll not let you go. I'll not let you go. But we pray. I want to say this. We verbalize. We speak with intensity. God, I love you. Your word says this. It's not your will that, it is your will this. And we verbalize with fervency and resolve and persistence and not giving up. But listen, we also listen with fervency. Some of the greatest times that we have in prayer is when we say absolutely nothing. We can spend a lot of time in prayer. It doesn't mean we're speaking all the time. Much of the time, we just be quiet. That's how we hear the still small voice. But we listen with fervency as well. The effectual fervent prayer. And we spend much time in praying. I think I'm about my last point here. 
We spend much time in praying. There is a time for short prayers. The thief on the cross. Lord, remember me. There are times that we cannot help but make short prayers. Something happening is evolving so quickly. We've got to pray right now. It's a short prayer. Is that scriptural? Absolutely. Some of the greatest prayers in the Bible had no language. There is a time for short prayer, but they should be undergirded by seasons and times of long prayer. Edward Bounds wrote a great series on prayer, the essential works of, or essentials, well, the works of Edward Bounds. Wrote on prayer, amazing collection of books, eight books. The complete works of Edward Bounds. He said, no man can do a great and enduring work for God, lest he be a man of prayer. And no man can be a man of prayer, except he spend much time in praying. We've got to spend much time in praying. I'll prove it. We have much to pray for. The Bible says, I, I exhort, therefore, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Well, that's quite a bit right there. I go into prayer. It's time to adore God for who he is, to confess my need to him, to give thanks to him. That takes quite a long time. I can't put a number to it, but it takes some time. Consider this. We pray for ourselves. We pray for our families. We pray for our church. We pray for our city. We pray for our nation. We pray for the world. Friends, you can't do that going down I-25 with your turn signal on, waiting for that next exit. You can't cover all those things. It takes time to get shut away with God. It takes time to get shut away with him. I must pray for this. Was it Paul? I'm not sure. Who said, I'll not sin by not praying for you. I've been in this school of prayer. I've been learning to pray. I'm a student of prayer. I'm not... I don't know it as I should, and I won't until my very last day. But I'm a student of prayer, and I'm learning there's so much to pray for. And I found out that when we thank God, and we confess our need for him, and we praise the Lord, and we acknowledge who he is, it takes quite a bit of time. When I thank God, I don't want it to sound that way. If we thank God... And brother, sister, we say, Lord, thank you for taking that crown of thorns for me. Thank you for putting on humanity for me. Thank you for clotting this, uh, treading this dirty earth for me. Thank you, Lord, for that purple robe that they put on you. Thank you, Lord, for that reed that you put in your hand. You accept it. You put it in your hand. Thank you, God, for your hands and your feet. Thank you, Lord, for taking the beatings, the punishment for me. Thank you, Lord, for your precious blood shed for me and all the world. Thank you, God, for taking the stripes for me. Thank you, God, for taking the beatings, the visage. His face was changed. Thank you, God, for taking that punishment that was meant for me. And you remember that the very same is no longer crowned with a crown of thorns, but with many crowns. He's not adorned with humanity. He's adorned with majesty and splendor. And there's not a reed in his hand. It's a scepter of righteousness. And his feet are not shod with some poor man's sandals. They're shod with his feet are like fine brasses that they burned in a furnace. And his voice is not mild. His voice is as the sound of many waters. And you begin to put these things together in prayer when the door is closed and you find, my gosh, I've been here for X amount of time, much more time than I thought, but I can't help it. I must be here. And then to pray, if I'm going to pray for church, needs come up, go home, make a note of it, say, I'm going to pray for this, pray for my family, pray for this. And as I went, if you notice, from the inside out, we pray for ourselves, our family, our church, our city, nation, and world. There is so much to pray for, and that takes time. Remember Peter's example in Acts chapter 10. We have to make time. I promise you I'm almost finished here. Adorinum, 
Adoniram Judson, Adoniram Judson, Judson, was a missionary, he and his wife, to Burma. Uh, it was, it now has a different name, I can't say it, but it's, it's called, uh, it was called Burma. He went there and Judson, he said, do your diligence to make prayer such that you can leisurely, that's the word he used, leisurely can devote two to three hours every day to prayer. And he gave his pattern for prayer. Edward Bounds wrote about it. It went something like this. He woke up in the middle of the night and he prayed. He got up about six in the morning and he prayed. Nine o'clock, 12 noon, three in the afternoon, 6 p.m., 9 p.m., Judson prayed. Well, I can't do that. Not many people can. And that's, I mean, not, it's, we have responsibilities. But he could. What he did is he took all of his concerns and he put them around these different periods. I'll pray for this. I'll pray for this. Pray for this. My intent tonight is not to tell you how. That's between you and the Lord. But there's so much to pray for that I do think, and I will say with conviction, that we have to be very deliberate about it. Not slipshod and we just, well, I kind of pray for this and, you know, whenever. If I just think about it, we've got to be intentional. I love how Brother Wells said the other day on, in the, uh, the Wednesday study. And he said, um, as we were about to pray, if you don't believe that God can answer these prayers, let's just go ahead with the study. Let's go ahead and begin. And I thought that was so good to hear that. We ought to say that. If you don't believe that God's going to answer, let's, let's just leave the room and come back and when, when we're done praying. Just leave. I thought that was very wise. Well, anyway, Judson, he said, I've got to pray for all these different things to leisurely put in two to three hours. I can't do that. Understandable. But if we're praying for 10 minutes a day, I'm pretty sure we can make that 15 minutes. I'm pretty sure because I found out if you set aside a little bit of time for God in prayer, he will make a way to give you a little bit more time. Say, I cut out this. I hope nobody's watching TV, that garbage. You say, get, get rid of it, put it in a dumpster. And then say, well, I've got a little more time here to pray. And be deliberate about it and intentional. If I make a dinner reservation, I know what time to be there. If I make a, an appointment with anybody, I know when to be there. How about an appointed time to meet with God? I just, I just put that in there. We have so many things to pray for. And I would not want to get on the other side of eternity and find out there was so much to pray for and we didn't pray for it. The privilege of prayer. One thing I've always learned, or one thing I learned, not always, one thing I learned, because I have a military background, I got to go different places. There was places in this Bible. I've got to, got to stand there and read the Bible and stand there and look at the same place. Beautiful places. But the, the things that I remember about these places in each one, I, I did attempt to find a place to get away with God, whether it was a school, military school, training, deployment, whatever. I always tried to identify a place, and those are the places I remember. I remember a field in Germany. I remember a hilltop in the Middle East. I remember ocean streams. I remember all those places vividly because that's where I was alone with God. And I hope that if you don't know that, now, I hope you will soon. Praying in the secret place. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Amen.